Hello guys, welcome to another episode of Let's Make a Game, where we're going to be making uh, Flappy Bird. Uh, so today, what I chose for us to tackle is uh, Collision. Now, it's going to be a somewhat math-heavy video, uh, but just bear with me. By the end of this, what we're going to be able to have is the ability to check if two rectangles um, are colliding. Now, that sounds simple enough, uh, but it gets a lot complicated when you start thinking about rotation. So let me show you what I'm talking about. Um, so when you have two rectangles, let's say rectangle one, rectangle two, it's A and B, let's say, um, they these two are not colliding. If they were, let's say they were like this, that's an easy check. Where we can get the collision rect and figure out what this is and determine that these two are indeed colliding. Um, so usually what you do for that is you do like a bounce check on the X's and the Y's and then that's what gets you these two because these will overlap, this will overlap with this and this will overlap with this and that gets you this. Um, but things start to get a little more complicated when you talk about rotating rectangles. Um, so for example, if we do, uh, given that uh, this is my coordinate system, if I have a rectangle that looks like this and another that looks like this, I can no longer do that bounce check because that, uh, that won't be correct. Um, so here's where we use um, math to help us figure out whether these are indeed colliding or not. Um, and specifically, we're going to be using what's called the separating axis theorem. Now, the separating axis theorem, I'll just read it out, out to you as to what the actual definition of it is, and then I'll explain it. Um, so the separating axis theorem states that for a pair of convex polygons that are not in a state of collision, there exists an axis perpendicular to an edge of one of the polygons that has no overlap between the projected vertices of the two polygons. Okay, so that's a mouthful. Uh, here's, here's what that means. Basically, we've got our two A and B rectangles. Um, what, what that is saying is that you, you look at each rectangle well, it, it, it's actually more specifically talking about convex polygons. The fact that we're using rectangles makes everything a lot easier. Um, but basically it's saying that for each vertex, so vertices here, we got one, two, three, four for A, and one, two, three, four for B. So for each vertex, um, you take uh, let me go blue here, I guess. Um, so you take each vertex and you get an axis from that vertex. Um, or sorry, from the two vertices. So that gives you, let's say, these two. If you look at these two here, you get an axis perpendicular to that for each side of the convex polygon. In our case, uh, because we're using rectangles, this axis uh, is perpendicular to both this side and this side, so we don't have to do one for this side. And the same can be said for the top one. So we get those two there, and then let's say we'll get these two here. So these two vertices give us this axis, and same here. Okay? So if you were to take that, um, so basically if you take this axis out, um, you, you're basically saying this, let's get a line across here, that is, and this would be here, this line would be, whoops, would be parallel to these two sides. Um, what it's saying then is that if you take, if there are, if you project each vertex of both convex polygons onto this line, and there exists a gap between the A, A projections and the B projections, then there is no collision. So let's work it out in this case. So if we, let's do white again, I guess. So in this case, if we project, so these two are going to be the same because you're projecting onto an axis that is perpendicular to both this and this side. Um, so you project these and you get a, a point right here. Now this point actually has an, an arbitrary value. It has, it has a scalar value along this axis um, that is, again, like I said, arbitrary, but it will help us define whether there is a gap or not. 
So we take these two and these two, right, and we get two points. Let's call this A max, and let's call this A min. And then we do, now for, for A, that works, we, can only, we only have to deal with two points. For B, we'll have to do all four, because this axis is perpendicular to only these two. We don't know if it's perpendicular to any of these, so we'll have to do all of them. So in this case, this green guy shows up like here. Um, this guy here, this guy actually pretty similar, let's say here, and this guy here. So in this case, we would want to check is A max and A min intersecting B max and B min. So in this case, we, we realize that this is max, this is min, so these two we don't care about anymore. We only want the extremities. So if, if we wanted like a real world example, what this could be is imagine a lamp. Well, imagine the sun, because the sun is bigger. Imagine the sun shining a light and casting a shadow. So at, at that angle, right? So the sun would cast rays, and you would get a shadow here. This would all be shadow. And this would all be shadow, right? From here to here on the object. And what you're looking for is light going through the, the two objects and that will tell you that they are not colliding. Um, in this case for this axis they are indeed colliding um, but we can't we can't say because obviously these two rects aren't actually colliding but based on this one calculation it looks like they are. Um, so for the separate axis theorem to actually work we need to check every single axis. So again the because we're using two rectangles it makes it a lot easier so generally we'd have four axes right four per rectangle in this case, we can we can bring that down uh, to two per two per rectangle, um, which will give us four in total instead of eight in total. So again, in this case, it looks like they are overlapping. So we need to continue and we need to test the other one. Now it's a lot easier to do it by eye. Like we can we can tell that if we take this guy and project these two, we can tell that they're going to overlap. Basically, you're looking for this, right? So this here for that axis overlaps with A. So that would, uh, we do all the calculations for that and we'd also see that, okay, they're still, they're still uh, colliding based on what we can tell so far. Let's try the next one. So then we'll try this one. Uh, let's try this one again. This one, and then for this one, again, we get a line. This, oops. So you get a line like this. And then again, obviously, these are going to be colliding. And then when we finally get to trying this axis, um, we're going to project um, B again for the for the rectangle whose axis belong that belongs to. We only try two points because we're using rectangles, which helps. And then so we get here's B max and B min, and then here's A, and then we have to do all four points again. So here's A max. And these two we don't care about, and here's a min. A min. So now here again, remember I told you we can get uh, if we get the dot product of these uh, vectors, if we get the dot product of this vector onto this axis, we get an arbitrary scalar value. Um, but for, even though they don't mean anything to us in terms of like space, um, they do mean something to us in terms of where along that axis these points are. And if we give it a scalar uh, an arbitrary value, let's say this has 50 and this has 20, and then in this case this would have 15 and let's say 5, right? Um, so we can use these values to determine if they overlap or not. So we use the dot product of each vertex onto that axis. And as you can see here, there actually is, um, let's go green, there is empty space. There is a gap between the projection of the two rects. Um, and this would indeed tell us that they are not colliding. Um, and again, it's like shining a light from this side. Uh, and then we cast a shadow here and here. And there would be light in between the two, the two objects. Um, okay, now, had we started with this axis, we actually would have been able to tell right away that they weren't colliding, and we could skip the rest of the calculations. Um, so that's something we'll definitely want to do, is after, once we're calculating them, if we find that there's a gap, Regardless of how many axes we've checked, uh, we're going to just take that and and uh, and and we're going to know that they're not colliding. If we check all four axes and none of them give us a gap, then they are colliding. And we're going to wrap all this math up into one nice little function. 
That's going to calculate everything for us and tell us if two rects uh, are colliding or not. Okay, so let's get into the actual code of it. Now, what, what would make the most sense here is for um, our rigid bodies. Um, whoops, there we go. So we have our rigid bodies here. Um, and they've got friction and position and velocity and all that. Um, and they actually take the position, yeah, it's a pointer to the position of the sprite. Um, so we can use that uh, to our advantage here. So what we'll want to do is keep track of a couple of things here. So we've got position, rotation, scale, and size. That all comes from, from, the, um, from the sprite it, uh, itself. And then we have uh, gravity, friction, and velocity. Um, and then what we'll want is uh, each rigid body to have a rect. And I'll define a rect as an object that belongs to a rigid body that defines the four vertices of where it is given a position right in the middle, right? Because we switched over to having position in the middle, so we'll give it like the half, half kind of thing, and we'll find out where each vertex is. So for that, we'll start and we'll create a new class. It really isn't a physics thing, it's more of a math thing. So let's add our rect class here. Oops. rect class is going to have um, a couple of things. It'll have, uh, here, let's bring in vector. Um, so it'll have a vector cause, a vector size. I think that's it. I think that's all it'll have um, for now, maybe. Uh, then we'll have a constructor. Let's construct it given a size and do the same thing given a cause as well. Actually, that's fine. There we go. And we'll define these. Um, and then for rects, we're going to want to uh, be able to move them around as well. So let's do our move by again. By or move to. Uh, then I think that's okay. Um, and then of course, what we're gonna want is given all this stuff, we're gonna want our four ver uh, vertices. Um, and I'm gonna make them public. I'm gonna make them easily accessible. Um, well, if we make them public, that means we can change each vertex individually. Um, so I don't think that makes much sense. Let's do, let's do that. So we have, um, so if we go back to our drawing for a sec, let's see. Let's call it, if this is A, and this is the upper side, and this is the lower side, and this is the left side, and this is the right side, we'll call them upper left, upper right, lower left and lower right. Does that make sense? So, and then we'll do the same for B. B, given this, of upper left, upper right, lower left, lower right. Yeah, let's do that. Um, so that's four vertices, so um, upper left vertex, um, upper right vertex, lower left and lower right. Cool. Um, I think I think that's all we need for now. Let's go ahead and implement this. Um, is that it? Yeah, I think we're good for now. So uh, if we initialize nothing, pause, size, um, that's it. Make 
she would call her initial one, C safe. Um, and I will say three zero. We'll give it a size here, so size initial size. Cool. Um, so uh, let's do our other functions. So void move by Definitely want a set size. Um, in case we change the size after. Um, cool. Um, now let's see. I guess we need, we're going to need to update the vertices every time something like this changes, right? Like we'll want to, like if we, if we change the position, we'll have to update the position of all of these vertices, because like we'll have to keep track of these as this rect changes. Um, so let's, let's make a private function for that. Um, update vertices. We'll have to call that function from like a lot of different places, but ultimately this is what it's going to do. Update vertices. Um, we'll actually calculate where where they need to be, right? So the bottom left, uh, lower left, lower left vertex. Um, three. So we want the pause x um, minus size x divided by 2, right? Uh, and then the pos y minus size y divided by 2. Does that make sense? Uh, x minus the width divided by 2. This is the lower left. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um, lower left, lower right, upper left, upper right. I knew this would happen. Okay, so lower left is pos.x minus, lower right will be pos.x plus pos.y plus, oh no, minus still. It's minus minus plus plus, and then minus plus minus plus. There we go. So that should update our, vertice, our vertices every time we move this rectangle. Yes. Okay. Um, okay, cool. So we have, I think that's everything we need for the rect part. Um, what we want now is to give our rigid body a rect. Um, so let's go to our rigid body. Let's include rect. And let's give it. Yeah, I guess we want a, a bounding rect. Cool. Um, let's pass that in too if we want. <clears throat> yeah, I think that makes sense. Okay. Then we'll go here, pass that in.
Okay. Mm. Okay, and that's fine. Now, when the rigid body changes, it's going to need to update its rect, right, to keep track of the vertices and where they're supposed to be. So, right, the rigid body is going to have, it's going to rotate, and we're going to have to rotate the vertices as well. Um, so, we are going to actually be changing these from the rigid body. Okay, let's make them public. I think that's okay. Let's make them public. And our rigid body is going to have to change them here because we're going to be rotating. Right? Here's the rotation. And the rotation is going to be based on the sprite that we rotate, right? So. Yeah, as we rotate, we're gonna we don't want to rot rotate these dots. Okay, so I think what I need to do first is create a function that rotates the points. Um, I think we're gonna start building up some math functions here. So why don't we create a math class? And I think this will mostly be static stuff. In fact, I think it'll just, it won't even actually, it shouldn't really be a class, right? Because I'm not going to instantiate math at all. It should just be a bunch of static functions I can use. Um, right? So, what do we want here? Um... Well, if it's not a class, it's going to be functions that we'll want to encapsulate somehow anyway, so without instantiating, right? So let's make a namespace, call it math. Um, let's see, what am I going to want here? Well, I'm going to want to rotate a point about a, about a, so I want to give it a point, a pivot point, and then how much to rotate it by, right? Um, so I'm going to want to uh, basically take, let's say I have a, um, let's see, let's say I have a rect with four points on it. Boom, 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 boom. And then I have, this is my position, this is the actual position. So like we've already done, right, we've said take this, take the width of the thing, divide it by two, add it, and then same with the height, and then you get upper right, upper left, lower left, lower right, right? So what I want to do is take, get a point, get a pivot point, and then that gives you this, and then how much to rotate it by, let's say 90, let's say 45 degrees, right? So if you rotate it by 45 degrees, I should then get a point somewhere up here, right? And then I want to do that for all points. So if this is this point, rotate it 45 degrees, the point around here, and the same thing all the way around, right? And then I'll get something that looks like this. So obviously my sprite rotates fine, but I need to rotate each vertex, vertex on its own. Um, so let's do that. Um, so I guess the first thing I care about is say three rotate point. So we'll take a point, we'll take a pivot point, and we'll take a rotation value. And yes, we'll have to include the vector. Um, okay, and then, oops. So, in the namespace, uh, we'll have to define these things so we can this, and then we'll have right, yeah, point, 
pivot rot. So to rotate a point, I actually need a couple other things, right? I need um, let's see, I need I need pi because I need to convert because I'm doing everything in degrees, but the math for rotating a point um, is in radians, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So let's do that. Let's um, do something like float. Uh, actually, let's use doubles here. Since we're dealing with pi, we'll want precision in this case. Um, so double converts to radians, and we'll give it a degree. And then double convert to degrees, and give it a radians. Um, and that's pretty straightforward. So so to convert to radians, we take the degrees, and then we multiply it by pi, and we divide it by 180. Um, so we need pi. I'm just going to make a pi constant, uh, 3.14159. That should be enough. And I usually always just go up to this amount. I, anything after that, I really don't care. Um, so let's return degrees. Oh wait, bracket right degrees times pi divided by 180. So the reason, actually, I don't even think the brackets are necessary, but I like to be explicit like that. Two degrees and and so this is. Uh, basically the same thing except you switch them right so you go return radians um, times 180 divided by pi that's how you get back to radians uh, sorry back to degrees um, okay so we've got that um, that's all we need really so we can we should be able to do this now so okay so we're given a point first thing we want to do is take the rotation, right, because the rotation is in degrees and convert it to radians, right? And now we're dealing in doubles, so let's say double um, rad rot okay, radians rot. And then we have we need sine and cos here, so maybe we include actual math math dot h yeah. Um, so let's take sine of rad rot and cos of rad rot. Um, so, so what I'm going to do here, and I think I can kind of show this. Um, so I'm going to take a point, right? So in this case, I'm going to take this. Well, I guess I could use this drawing. I'm going to take this point. I'm going to move it to the pivot. I'm going to put it here. Then I'm going to rotate the point, kind of. It, it'll, I rotate the point, and then I move the point back by the same amount that I moved it. And that, after rotating the point, should get me here. That's generally how you rotate a point. You move it, you rotate, and then you move it back. And really what you're kind of doing is, you can think of it as rotating the this from this to this based on that rotation value and then you go from here to here and then you move it back so you go from here to here and then you move it back and now you're if you rotate this back so that we could see it you're up here instead of over here okay um, it's just the way the math works you can you can look up how to rotate points it's it's all been done before kind of thing um, so let's translate the point to the pivot so we'll say point um, dot x uh, minus equals pivot dot x actually we should be able to do this um, just point equals point minus pivot right um, and that'll subtract the x from the x from the x and the y from the y then we'll rotate the point itself um, so basically that'll give us a new point right a new a new x and a y um, so let's say, and then we'll convert it back to floats after the math has been done. <clears throat> so new x, uh, we'll say, equals uh, converting to floats, and then we'll have 
point dot x times cos minus point dot y times sine. Oh, uh, and this is cos and sine of that theta of the the radians uh, of the rotation in radians. And then float new y is float point dot x times sine. Um, in this kind of you go plus point dot y times cos. So this has rotated the points, um, and then we have to move it back. So point dot x is new x plus pivot dot x, and point dot y is new y plus pivot dot y. Okay, uh, if you didn't follow along, I'm not going to get too much into what, how the math works, um, but this looks correct. So we take the rotation in degrees, we convert it to radians, and then we calculate sine at, at that theta and cos at that theta. Then we say, take the point and subtract pivot from it, so we get the point at the pivot. Because we, we, can't, we can't set it to the pivot, we have to subtract from the pivot, because then when we add it back after the fact, um, It'll it'll end up where it needs to be. Uh, then we create our, we get our new x and y's, which is um, the points x times cos minus the points y times sine for the x, and then the y is the points x times sine plus the points y times cos. And then you take get you you basically take the new points. Well, we'll, we'll reuse point right because then we have to return point. There we go. So point dot x equals the new x that we've rotated, and then we add pivots y. Remember, we subtracted it up here, so we added it up here. Um, yeah, I think this makes sense. Uh, so now we've rotated a point, so we can go back to um, rigid body, where we're going to have to use this here in the update, based on whether this rotated or not, right? And it makes sense to do that in the rigid body, even though the rigid body isn't the one rotating. It's just keeping track of the rotation from the sprite. And then it uses that here to rotate to rotate this so we can draw it properly. Um, this actually will probably end up no longer doing this because this will, even if we rotate, it'll it'll just draw a rectangle around it. What we're gonna want here is to draw a line lines between our points. So we'll have to do that too. Um, but for now, let's go up here and figure out what it is we need to do here. So we, we apply velocity, all that's good. Um, so we apply the velocity to the position. So I think what I need to do here is um, take our rect. Let's start with bottom or lower left. I should have just named the bottom. I keep saying bottom. Lower left vertex, uh, then we'll want to do, uh, we have to include math in here now. Oh, wait, did we already include math? No, we didn't. We'll include it here since we don't need it over there. Um, so we'll want to take this lower left vertex and we want to actually rotate it. So we're going to call our function, right? So math, rotate point. We'll pass itself again, right? So bottom, uh, no, <laughs> bounding rect dot lower left vertex. Um, the pivot point, uh, it's not the position because the rigid body is moving with the, yeah, the rigid body is moving with the sprite. So if I give it the sprite's position, we're going to be offset from the rigid body, right? Like if the sprite's position, let's say we have, um, oh so we have x, y, or x, y, right? Zero, zero. If our sprite is here, our rigid body takes that position. So if, we'll, if we tell it, we have to tell it to, yeah, we have to tell it to rotate about zero, which would be here in the middle. Because if we tell it to rotate about the position again, it's going to take the, the actual x and y position of, the, of this. And again, this moves with the sprite. So then if this was, let's say, 100 and 100, 
we'd actually be asking it to rotate about 100, 100. We'd actually be asking the pivot point to be here. And then this would basically go rotate like this. So we don't want that. So we have, I think we have to give it zero here. Um, so let's give it zero and then the rotation right so in this case the rotation we're passing through is a relative rotation right not an absolute rotation like if I'm rotated um, if my sprite is rotated like this at a negative 45 degree angle every time we we're gonna call this on the update function right so we can't so we're taking these four right when we're rotating we can't take the absolute because then it'll rotate by negative 45 degrees every time and it'll just spin really fast right so I think we actually need to keep track of what our last rotation was and then use the difference of those two to rotate the points right because if our, if our last rotation let's say was like this uh, use a different color for that. If our last rotation was like this, then we've rotated by this amount, right? Then we've actually, well, it would be more like this. And then we should only be using this value, whatever this is, and then we update, and then that way they're the same and we don't do it again. Yeah, so we'll have to do that. Um, so we have to keep track of our last rotation too. Um, so this one we'll keep track of locally. We don't, or like, well, we'll just copy it over. We don't need to actually reference the picture for it, the image the sprite. Um, so rot and then last rot equals rot. Um, what? Last rot, right? Oh, yeah, sorry. Dereference rot. Um, so we'll do, yeah, we do that. And then, so here we'll want it to be, I guess, um, the current rot. So dereference rotation. And then minus last rot. And if there was, a, if there's a difference. So really, uh, so that should actually do what we want it to do. We should put this all in, like, if last rot doesn't equal rot right so if we've actually changed if we've actually rotated then we'll update these vertices and then we'll do this for each left right should do it right like oh the, the math takes the math rotate point takes care of that we just pass in the point we want to rotate about zero and then and then we take the difference in the rotation and then we have to update our last rot don't we like this um, okay I think this is good. Um, what we'll want to do is update our render and actually just draw, because we'll want to see, we we'll want to be able to see if this is rotating properly. Um, so we'll want to render, um, yeah, we don't care about these points anymore. We'll continue to translate. Oh. Oh, yeah, I think. Well, we no longer we no longer want to rotate. Um, we don't we no longer want to do this, right? Because we're we're going to be modifying the point, the vectors directly, the vertices. Sorry, we're going to be modif modifying the vertices directly. We're going to draw between those vertices, so we don't want OpenGL to rotate anything like the the universe for us, right? The scale is fine, I think. Yeah, I think. 
Let's remove this, and then we're just going to draw between the points. Because we've already done that for, this basically done what OpenGL does, right? We've rotated the points ourselves. So we should just draw between those points that are already rotated. Um, yeah, I think so. So we'll begin lines, uh, and then we'll do, <clears throat> this is going to be much simpler now, right? It'll be bounding rect, let's say, uh, lower left. Um, dot x from lower left x no wait in this case now though these are floats so this needs to be float and then we're saying bounding rects lower left vertex is x yeah yeah we're giving it points so then uh, lower left vertex is y there we go so from Basically, from bottom left, let's remove all this. From bottom left uh, to lower right. From lower right to upper right. From upper right to upper left. from upper left to lower left there I think that works I think this this should work uh, let's give that a try um, are we yeah we are drawing this aren't we yes we are so it should rotate um, so we sh it shouldn't actually be any different right oh oh that's right and it should lift it. oh that's right yeah yeah so we'll actually Let's see, what do we want to pass here? Yeah, okay. So we'll want our flapper to have a bounding rect. Right, we have a ridge body. And we want a bounding rect as well. here um, so oops. we want to do stuff to that right beforehand right we want to um, say well I guess it's not actually gonna change right we don't need, we shouldn't need to keep track of it we just want to set it up here so let's go back to flapper let's put it in there Let's just create it here. Right? And then we'll set the size here. Because nothing's going to change. Um, uh, 
So, okay, what's the size going to be? So we want the size to be based on the, well, Yeah, no, that's fine. So we'll say um, size so we'll say uh, Size x, size y, and zero. I'm gonna just make Hmm. It was bright. Flapper sprite. Oh, we're just passing in a vector. Oops. We can just pass in size directly. So let's just try it again. Size, size, not oh, actually sprite, but get size. Right? Which are three? This returns a pointer. Yeah, okay. Let's just do reference that thing. Okay, so we'll take a size. Um, and then we'll want to. Well, that should be everything, I think. That should be everything we need. Let's try it. Okay, so we. I don't think we're drawing properly. Hmm. Okay, here's what we're going to do we're going to take. Um, let's say flap. Let's say update, we don't care. Let's see, let's go to rigid body um, and the update. Let's not be affected by gravity for a second. Um, and then what will we do here is we'll say. If you flap, rotate, let's not set any velocity. Let's rotate um, 10 degrees and update. And then we'll do that. And we don't want this anymore. I just don't want it, want it to rotate, and I want it to make it so that every time I click, it'll rotate 10 degrees. It is doing it. 10 degrees is very small, but it is changing. Um, so I want to see why this is not working. So let's go to our um, rect here. We need to figure out what these are, right? Then that way, I think we can figure out where the issue is. So. And let's just have like a let's do a let's do a two string on it.
two string. So uh, we'll build a string and we'll probably need we have values and we have text, so let's use string string here. Oops, a string. Yeah. Okay. String stream ss. So let's say pause. Pause. Uh, Pause. 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 Pause x, pause y, pause z, size, 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 Yeah? Yeah, okay. And then let's go back to our lab, well, our rigid body actually. On its update. Oh, maybe this is never happening, and then we're starting with weird values, right? Yeah, let's do that. Let's just do a restaurant. And then we'll see how it's um wrecked about two strings. Let's try that, let's see what we get. So the difference is so it's zero and zero. Size is twelve hundred by six fifty four. Oh. And look, yeah, so it is rotating. Hmm. I think we're rotating it by 10. Let's see. That doesn't really help, right? We want to really want know where the vertices are. Let's print out where the vertices are. Let's see. Size is really big, though. I have a feeling that's what's going on. We're scaling this. Let's see, we're scaling this uh, flapper, aren't we? Like, the, are we scaling the sprite? We're passing in the sprite. So let's go here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're setting the scale directly on the sprite. By the time, so the the size will still be the same, but the scale will be different, right? Sprite has a scale on it. We'll have to take we'll have to take the scale into account. So that's definitely what's happening. I think our we're drawing like our rect is actually way too big because there should be a quarter of the size. But let's just can go on the start, and we, I want to make sure I see the points changing. Um, so we'll the the position, and we'll say, let's just take the lower left and the upper right. So um, lower left dot x, lower left x dot x, um, y. And then a 
upper left, upper right dot x, upper right x, y. And that's it. We don't want to end all at the end because we just want one long string. And we'll end it on the other side. So, hmm, there's still zero. But I am getting a warning. Oh, wait a minute. Is that rotating? Oh, right. If I hold space, it's a lot faster. It makes sense. I've been clicking this whole time. Um, okay, so the rotation is getting updated properly. And right, it's 10 degrees, but we're multiplying by delta time. Um, the positions are still zero, though, so that's not good. Let's figure out what's happening. We should be calling update. These oh, oh, my god. We're supposed to be calling update vertices every time we do something to this thing, right? So we basically just want to do this. Uh, I forgot to do that. Okay, so we'll... Yeah, every time we update the position, we have to recalculate this. Every time we move by or two or change the size, we have to recalculate this. We don't actually have to do it only two switches. Yeah, so we had the code to change them the whole time, and then we were never using them. There we go. So there's values, and yeah, they're changing. It's hard to tell if they're actually rotating. Oh, look, look, look. <laughs> we're drawing. Okay, so we were actually fine. So that size is actually... Legitimate. This is the real thing, and these are our real vectors rotating about the center in real time. Like we're, we are calculating the position of these every single time. That's awesome. Because now, now we can handle collisions with rotated rectangles very easily because we know where the vertices are. We just have to punch them into the the separating axis separating axis theorem, right? Okay, this is looking a lot better now. It's a little grim before, but I think we're good. So the two string, we can leave it because we probably still care about it. We just don't have to call it anymore. Um, we know our little rotations is working. Um, let's bring. Well, no, let's leave it the same. And then what I'll do is like I'll have I'll have a rectangle like up here somewhere. I'll have something like say another plane up here, and then I'll rotate it. So that they start colliding, like the it could be up here, and then they'll collide, and then we should be able to see that they're colliding, and we'll probably print out if they're colliding or not. Because right now, like as you can see, I've, I've, I've kind of removed some of the stuff we did before, which is like the, the mechanics of the plane, because I really want to make sure that we get this collision down before we start adding like the pipes that come and actually start building the rest of the game. We need to make sure our collisions work. So um, this is awesome. Okay, let's go back to which okay wait so so my other hunch about the sprite scale right so it must mean that when I get when I say give me the size I'm returning the size so we must be changing the size based on the scale like um, if I say set scale I set the scale And we're just using the scale here. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay, that's fine. Because we're scaling here, and we're scaling at the rigid body level, right? We're scaling here as well. That's why that's why it's working. So my original hunch of saying that we have to take the scale into account, we actually already do that. Um, so that's good. Actually, wait, let's make it a little bigger. I think it's like GL border width, no line width. Make it like six. I don't know. I don't know how big that is, but that's a little too thick. Let's make it um, two point five. That's nice. Nice. Okay. Cool. All right. So we've got one. Um, we've got the the vertices updating properly. So let's create another sprite. Um, Sprite 2, we should probably rename it. We'll probably end up actually moving it out of main. Eventually we'll have like a game manager that deals with all the game objects and everything. For now, we'll just do this. We'll have Sprite 2. We'll have, we don't want another flapper. 
Well, we do actually, because, well, it shouldn't be another flapper, but it needs to be a sprite that has a rigid body. Um, but for now, let's let's just make it another flapper. It's just gonna work. Let's find out. Input manager. We only give. We only have one flapper, so we'll only give that to that guy. We'll say. Um, player dot update. Player two dot update. Player dot render. Player two dot render. Let's see if that works. So we should see one rotating and one not rotating. Perfect. Okay, good. Um, and they both have rects, as you can see, we're drawing them. Um, so let's just move this guy. Um, test sprite two dot move by. Um, let's move it up left by like fifty, up by fifty. Let's just try that. See if that's enough. I basically want them. Oh, what? Didn't, didn't work. Um, oh, this guy. This guy changes the position directly. This one. Um, and it's update. We say sprite update, rigid body update. Hmm. We have to do the rigid body. Let's see. I don't think we actually ever. Um, these are the colors, right? Yeah, that's fine. I don't think we actually ever set the position from here, from flapper, and we don't. We shouldn't be setting it directly in the rigid body either. We just take the position and we deal. We do stuff with it based on the velocity. We add forces. We set velocities. That should be fine. So how come that move didn't work? Let's see, we have set sprite 2, set scale, move by. Then we have create the second flapper, which doesn't modify the position. We update and we render. Huh. Let's see. Oops. Oh, maybe we did move by. Uh, we should do move two, I guess. Move by is going to take that into account, which doesn't really make sense in this case, does it? So maybe it is moving in just a very small amount because I only gave it a very small number. Um, let's say move two. Right, because we're giving it this position, so let's just go like this. Um, in this case, we want, let's say, 2.5. And 2.5. See if that works. So I guess we could have just given it a different starting initial starting position. So yeah, let's do that. So instead of 2.5, we'll see. We'll say 1. 1. 1.6. 1.6. I basically want it up enough. Um, let's make this one point. So if we make it divided by two, let's make it divided by three. Let's make this divided by one point eight. So like that, I just need it higher. Um, three is a little too much. Two point eight. Uh, let's make this one point. Well, this actually it's going up. Yeah, so this will have to be, let's say, 1.2. There we go. Now, will that actually collide if I rotate enough? I don't think so. Oh, so close. Okay, let's move it down just a bit, and then we should be good. So, let's, point, let's say 2.5. Might be too much. 2.2. Two. I think that's good. I think that'll collide there. So basically I want this to tell me not colliding, not colliding, not colliding, and then as soon as I do even that, that should now start saying colliding until I do that and then not colliding. That's what I want. And if I get that, I'm happy and we're done for the day. And then we got this side too, okay?
So I think we've got everything we need in place now to actually start. Well, no, we don't. <laughs> we uh, we need a couple. Yeah, we need a couple more things because separate access theorem uses dot products and projects vectors onto one another. So we need to create those. Um, what I think I want to do is make them static, so that I can just say, "Hey, vector three, give here's two vectors. Please give me the resulting dot product or the pro, pro, uh, re, a resulting project term vector." Um, so let's do that. Static float. So a dot product gives us uh, a float back, and we'll take vector three, one, vector three, two. Uh, let's call it A and B. It's faster. A and B. Good. And then, uh, it's not the same. Static vector 3, uh, project, or project really. Vector 3, A and B. Yes, that makes sense. Okay. So let's go ahead and actually implement these. So these are going to be um, static. Let's put them at the top. Um, vector three A and const vector three reference B. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to go over what exactly the dot product and like the math behind the dot product or the projection calculating a pro uh, the projection of one onto another. Um, the dot product is very easy. You basically just take the x of of a and b, multiply them together, and then add the the multiply the the product of y of the y's for both. So you say um, this is a one liner like a dot. So it's a dot x times um, b dot x plus a dot y times b dot y. Simple. So you say multiply the x's and multiply the y's and then add the two together. That's it. Easy. Um, project is a little difference, uh, different. So we'll, what this is is basically you take, um, let's say you take a vector, right, that guy, and then you take another vector, let's say this guy, and what project is is you take these two vectors and you do math on them so that you can calculate what it would look like if you projected this, let's say this is A and B, if you projected B onto A. So it's basically the kind of like the shadow thing I was talking about. So if you have the sun, you this would cast a shadow that is perpendicular to A, and you would get this resulting vector from the, pro, the projection, calculating the projection. Um, uh, yeah, that's all it is. And then we'll get this back, and that, that'll be what we return. And that's why this returns a vector as opposed to any like a scalar value like the other one. Um, so the so this what we're gonna do is we just got again O one liner it um, vector three and then so we to actually calculate the projection we need to do the dot product of the two and then we 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 divide it by what is it we do the dot product of the two and then we divide it by um, the one you're projecting onto is x squared plus y squared times x at the end of it times the x of the, the one you're projecting on it. Anyways, again, like like I said, if you're really interested, you can look at the math. There's plenty of examples and explanations online. Um, basically, what we want is this: so vector three um, dot of a and b. So we want dot product of a and b. Take that and divide it by. Um, but we have math in here. We should get math in here. Do we have it? No. Because I'll need the pal. So and we're going to want a little bit double. So we want floats uh, of pal of b dot x to the power of two plus um, again float pal. Um, b dot y to the power of 2. Um, that's it. And then we multiply that by b dot x. 
um, and that's one. So that's our x. So our y will be again the dot product of a and b divided by actually it's the same, is it? Divided by the b's x squared plus b's y squared. But this time we multiply it by b dot y and then zero. There. Why is that why is that not when doing that? Put your three to float. Oh, whoops. Wait, what? There we go. Okay, and that's how we project um, a vector onto another, A onto B in this case. Um, okay, cool. So that's all we need. Um, let's go to our ridge body now. And I think what we're going to do is we're going to want. Um, Okay, I think what we're going to want to do is take create a static method again, and this one will basically say check if two rigid bodies are colliding based on their rects that have the vertices we care about, right? Um, and it'll basically return true or false. So uh, let's say is colliding, and we'll take a const. We do actually we only care about the rects, right? No, we need the whole thing. Rigid body. Um, let's say A. So rigid body A. Rigid body B. Okay. And this will be static. So we can call it on it on any two rigid bodies. Okay. This is the fun part. This is what we've been waiting for here. Oops. So, okay, so here is where we're actually going to, whew, all right, are, you, are we ready? So here's what we're doing. We're doing this, no, where is it? This. <laughs> we're doing this. Um, it's actually not too bad. There's very there's some very specific steps we can break this down into. So the first thing we want is to let's make it easier to reference the the rect speed within them. So rect um, RCA equals RBA dot uh, bounding rect and then rect RCB RBB dot bounding rect. Okay, so what we want is to take the vertices and we have upper right we want the vertices of each one which we'll have we can say rc dot rca dot and then upper and lower so we have each vertex what we're going to want is to keep track of um, this part right the a max a min b max b min so a max A min, B max, B min. Okay, and then we're going to want, again, these axes, right? One, two, three, and four. So, um, axis one is, um, and to get, it, to get the axis, you take one vector minus the other vector, right? So, axis one will say um, RCA dot um, upper right say upper right minus rca dot upper left vertex so we say upper right minus upper right up sorry upper right minus upper left each point subtract the two to get an axis perpendicular to those two like that cool uh, and if we subtract it the other way we get an axis in the other direction which is which is mean this one but again because we're rectangles we don't care so we're good so this is a uh, axis one axis two axis three axis four I should probably A is being referenced as the one, so let's call it axis one. Um, uh, two, three, four, and this will be A upper right minus A upper left. And then for the other side, we do A upper right minus A lower right. 
axis 3 will be on the B side. And then we'll say we can say B upper, let's do left here. B upper left minus B um, bottom left and upper right we can see that. Lower left and upper oops. Upper left, lower left, and then upper left, upper right. Yes? Up, um, upper, let's see, upper right, upper left, and then upper right, lower left, lower right. Upper left, lower left, that gives us the side, and then upper left, upper right gives us the bottom part. Okay, good. We have our four axes. Um, so now we're going to want to iterate through each axis. Um, that'll kind of be annoying to write this big if statement for each one. Because um, really we're going through each one until we find one that does not collide. And once we have that, we know that we are not colliding. Um, so here, here's an easy way to do it. Let's just include. Um, vector let's just create a vector um, of vector threes called axes and then axes dot push back axis one two three four and I'm Okay, here's where the magic's gonna happen. So, first thing we need to do, we have the axes, we have all the points. So we need to project, well, what do we need to do? We, yeah, we need to project each vector. So each point, each axis. Yes, project each axis onto this, sorry, project each vertex onto this axis um, and then keep track of that so let's say um, a upper right projection Ugh, God, this is gonna be messy but it's okay a upper right projection will be vector three project and we'll want to project our RCA dot um, upper right onto the current axis <clears throat> okay and we want to do that for the four points on each box like in this case yeah we'll have to do the four points because we don't know which axis we're checking right but that's fine it's not like it's computationally upsetting upper right um, upper left lower right lower left um, let's say upper right upper left lower right no left so upper right upper left lower right lower left and that's upper right upper left lower right lower left um and then we'll do this in here Oops. Yes? Upper right, upper left, lower right, lower left, upper right, upper left, lower right, lower right, lower left. A and B. Okay, we have the four the eight projections. So then we need so now that we've projected, right? So we've projected this, for example, in this case, right? We've projected upper right onto this axis. Now we need to know what that value is, right? That what that A max is. Or in this we don't even know if it's max yet or not, right? But whatever that point is, we need to know, we need to give figure out this which is the dot product of that projection onto this axis that dot product will give us a value that again is somewhat arbitrary because it doesn't give us any any information other than the fact that it tells us the relative position on to this on this axis of each vertex yes okay so it'll be very similar so we'll want um, 
a upper right, let's say, scalar value, right? And that'll be the dot product of um, the projection, a upper right projection, onto the same axis. Right, upper right, upper left, lower right, lower left, upper right, upper left, lower right, lower right, lower left. Um, B, B. Okay, now we have our eight scalars. Now we need to figure out which one's max and which one's min. Um, Let's take some of this. This is already getting pretty hefty. Um, so let's do this. Let's go to math. Let's have um, a vector three. No, a float, right? Float. These are floats, right? Um, yeah, it's just scalar values. So let's say, let's create a min and a max. But let's take a vector. Floats called um, X and then we see for max there. So we can pass in as many floats as we want um, and if we calculate the min and the max on each one of those. So let's go in here. Float min. X. So let's do min first. Um, no. Min. So let's keep track of our min. And let's say for now it's, it's the first one. And then we'll check the first one against the rest, right? And then keep track of our min. So for. Uh, we should start at the first one because we already we're assuming this one is already the minimum, so we'll start at the next one. And then if x at i is less than min, then min is x at i. We could just call maths min on these two values, right? Min equals um, min. Oh god, <laughs> it's a naming weirdness here. Um, no, I don't like that. Well, we should we should call this uh, ret val, right? Ret val equals min of ret val and x at i. Does that make sense? I thought, how does math not have min in it? Min of math Huh. I must be missing something. Good math. We used it for sine and cos. Is it all min with a capital M? In math, no. Oh well, let's just do that now. Um, if x and i is less than that now, then that now equals x and i. Let's just do this way for now. Um, okay, so then we go through our entire list, we find the minimum one, and then we return that now. Simple. Do the same for max. this case, if L is 0, we'll go through each one. If there is a greater one, keep track of it and then return the maximum. Perfect. Um, so let's go back to our rigid body and so we'll basically just say vector floats. We'll call it um, A, um, A scalars. <laughs> we'll want to push back 
R4. A U R scalar. Up right, up left, lower right, lower left. Um, okay, and then we have our min and max here, so we can just say a min equals uh, math min, pass in a scalars, and then a max equals math max of a scalars. Okay, and do the same for b. Okay, so now we have our a max, a min, b max, b min. So now we can actually check. Now we have, we're at this stage here, right? We've got this. Now we want to check these bounds to see if they are within each other or not. Um, so if the if b's min is less than or equal to a's max, so if b's min is less than or equal to a's max, and b's max is greater than or equal to a's min, right? If b's min is less than or equal to a's max, and b's max is greater than or equal to a's min, yeah, I think that makes sense. If if that's well, but if that's true, then that means that they are intersecting. It means they actually overlap, but we can't actually do anything at this point, right? We have to let the we have to go through the entire for loop. We have to check all of the axes. So if not this, then we know we're not colliding, because the opposite of this would mean that there is a gap. Um, so we can do that, right? We can say if um, not if not that, we can return false. What's wrong here? Oh, we're going to return false already. As soon as we come across an axis that, yeah, as soon as we come across an axis that we, that has a gap, this, we return false, but you know we're not colliding. Otherwise, we have to run through the whole thing. And if we never return false, after going through all the axes, then that means that we are indeed colliding. Okay, I think this all makes sense. And the best way to test it is just to use it. So, um, in our flappers, well actually, we don't really have a way to do it from the flapper because the flapper doesn't know about anything else. We'll have to do it outside, we'll have to do it here. This, this guy here in the updates, will update everyone and then we'll check. Um, so I'll we'll need to pull in, well, actually, Flapper should pull it in, right? So we should be able to say, um, bool is colliding, is rigid body is colliding, and we'll pass in players.getRigidBody and player2s get rigid body. Oh, it's all come down to one line of code. Uh, okay, let's see out. Um, colliding. Um, otherwise, nothing. Oh, I guess we, they don't like ternaries inside of those. There we go. So we're saying see out. If it's colliding, see out this. Otherwise, see out this. Okay, moment of truth. Separating axis theorem. Here we go. Lots of warnings. Okay, not colliding. Good. I'm gonna rotate. Still not colliding. If oh man, this is insane. This is so exciting. Okay, here we go. Oh no, it didn't work. <laughs> what a letdown. Uh. Okay. Why did it not work?
negative 600, 327. And this guy is negative 600, 327. Oh, wait a minute. No. 512, 384. 365, 629. So yes, they're in different positions, but their bounding rects are the same. Oh snap. Their bounding rects are the same. So it thinks it's constantly... So all of this is going to be based on... Okay, I have a couple ideas here. The bounding rects are always the same for both A and B because the rect because they're the exact same sprite, right? So they're the same rect. But it's like I think the rect will need to take the position into account too. At least for this for the purpose of this calculation. Like it has to be like right, because they're rather the same, right? It has to be this it has to be based on their positions. So what if we just say something like oh, but we don't want to actually change the vertices themselves? Okay. Um, okay, let's try this. So we have the rect. Let's pull out each vertex and then add the position to the x or the y, whichever one we're doing, for that for that rigid body. Does that make sense? Let's try that. So a upper right is a dot um, is rc a dot upper right vertex um, plus the rigid body's rigid body has the object position, right? Rigid body a dot pause yeah let's do that so if we uh, oh that's right and again this is a dereference pause so we're taking what was like 600 and we're now adding the actual position of it for each vertex yeah Let's try that. So upper right, upper left, lower right, lower left. And then we add the position to it. That's all that. And we'll do B. See if that works. So okay, that's valid. No, again, same issue. Valid, same issue. Yeah, it looks like it's doing the same. One, two, three, four. Okay, let's see. So we're taking our upper right for text, which happens to be 600 and 327, which if I check the other one, it's going to be the same thing. Then we're adding the position to that vertex, so we should get 11, 12, 7, 11, and 965 and decimal places. 956 and decimal places, okay. 720,000, that's so odd. Um, oh, right. Okay, so sure, we, <laughs> we never actually ended up using these, right? So we made them, we never used them. So here, instead of that, instead of this actually, we'll want, yeah, because we're still, again, using the same values. So we want A upper right minus A upper left. This will be A upper right minus A lower right. A upper right minus A lower right. B upper left minus B lower left. 
B upper left minus B lower left. And then B upper left minus B upper right. B upper left minus B upper right. Okay, yeah, now we're using the new ones. Um, basically, oh, I'll have to change from all these here, all these two. So, this will be A upper right, A upper left, A lower right, A lower left. Okay, so now we use the new points which take into quite a position, then we project, then we get the dot product of that projection, and the rest should be the same. Let's see what that does. There shouldn't be the same values in this case. Like, okay, yeah, see, so these are different now. For some of them, they're still like weird. Let's see, let's just try. I don't know if this is actually going to do it. I'm getting this. Is, no, still nothing. Let me try. Um, here, let's try this. Just to make it a little easier. Um, let's say. Be able to move this around. Oh, did it say something? Oh, I just saw a switch. There's nothing, it's never. It's never doing it, it's never colliding. Okay. Um, so let's make this guy. Twitch, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's keep this uh, the second guy in the middle. Still scaling. Does the scale have anything to do with it? No. Is this, am I just missing this? You know, like if I do. So I just making making a silly mistake there. Oh no no. Oh man, every time I see that hello torch, I think it starts saying colliding. Our scaling. I think we need to <clears throat> not scale here. Because there, that way, there we're scaling just how we're drawing it, right? We're not scaling the actual values. So this. Is what it actually see yeah, on our viewport is tiny, so it's not going to change. But yeah, yeah, see this this is the real value here. That's not all. Yeah, we were bad to do that, right? So we were we were literally scaling the way we drew that, but the values are still where where you see them now. Um. Okay, so that's bad. Even though that that right there should tell me there's still. But anyways, let's fix one thing at a time. So what we want to do here is um. So we have, um, we get these, we rotate, that's the rotation, that's fine. So we need to, when we create the bounding rect, which we do here, with the size, it needs to be size times um, get scale. And that should give us proper, there we go. Okay, so that now we should be dealing with better values, I think. 
Let's go back here. Huh. This. Oh my god. I think this is the problem. I think that my project my project function was wrong. So what's gonna what this is gonna do is it's gonna take the dot product and divide it by this and then add this times this. But this based on the math needs to happen. This addition, we add this together by itself. So this divided by this, this divided by the sum of these two, and then multiply it by that. Okay, let's see what this does. Man, brutal. Oh, look at that. Oh my god. Oh, there it is. So much. Something so little. Oh man. Okay. Now, so okay, we. I know it doesn't sound like my voice. I'm actually so happy that this works now. Um, it's just, let's see. I'll test all the corners. I can test this. I can be right in the middle. It'll still be colliding right there. Oh, man. This works so well now. Okay. Here's the true test, though. The whole point of implementing this algorithm is so that we can detect collisions between rotating rectangles. Because we're going to be rotating, right? We're going to be fluctuating up and down. So let's see. If I rotate this, there's a collide collision right there. That tiny little pixel. Man, you got to love math. There it is. This is what we spent the last two and a half hours doing. Look at that. Collision. Oh, I gotta love it. Love it, love it, love it, love it. So obviously, for our game, the rect would be a little tighter and all that, but the point here is that we can now detect collisions between two rotated rectangles. If this was rotated, it would like the same way, as you can tell. Okay, we made it. We did it. Um... That took forever to find out, but sometimes you gotta go through that kind of stuff. Let's see. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, guys, I'm gonna leave it there. Um, so, to recap, this little guy. What's the problem? Oh, I'm so glad I checked it. I was at the point where I had to check everything that we did in that method. And for the longest time, I had assumed my project and dot um, functions were correct so I was looking at the wrong place but literally going step by step I was like alright let's check everything and here we go okay so um, I think this is really good like this basically sets us up now for building the rest of the game out and the, co the collisions will just work at this point right um, so let's before I finish up let's just bring our um, let's make a flapper do what it's supposed to do. Uh, this. Yeah. Okay. Right. We're still um. Input manager. Not do that anymore. It's just flap. Whoa, 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 whoa. Come on. Velocity. Come on, velocity. Come on, gravity. There we go. Oh. There goes our other plane. That's fine. Um.
Okay, that's good. Um, also, this is um, this is happening even if I leave it pressed. Which I didn't realize actually when my rotate when I was testing the rotation. If I leave it pressed, it's gonna keep flying. So we gotta fix that too. But again, we'll leave that for the next episode. Um, okay, guys, thank you very much for watching. Um, hopefully, you learned a lot today and <laughs> learned about how people debug sometimes. Um, and then I will see you uh, next time. So next time, I think what we'll end up doing is we'll fix up this input thing, um, and then we'll start creating our pipe object that will eventually have a game manager spawn as we progress through the game. Uh, we might not get that for our next video, but next video I think we'll create the pipe and have it move, um, and then we'll have us trying to fly through it. Um, okay, thanks a lot for watching, guys. See you next time.